keynote speaker. His name was Mike Strand. Mike was 26 in 1989 when he sustained a severe traumatic brain injury in a motor vehicle accident on his way home from work. It was several years before he could return to work full time. Brain injury challenged him like nothing else ever had. Honing his will on adversity, he set his intentions on becoming a quality person. In the intervening 24 years, he has written two books, as well as speaking and volunteering in a variety of activities. He's a past board member of the Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance, and is currently a facilitator for three support groups and a regular contributor to the BIAMS newsletter. After working over 23 years unsupported in a factory, he has recently retired from that job and is working towards an advanced degree in literature. Um, if you didn't know before, Mike is out selling his book at the table right outside these doors, and he's selling one of his books at a table, and you're free to get it to buy it from him, and if you want it signed, he's happy to sign it. Um, let's welcome Mike. And 
He, he, as soon as I started pulling out, he instantly knew that I could not see that sound effect. There's nothing he could do. I mean, it was, as soon as he realized it, I was there. And I just pulled out like there was no car coming. Met the truck, and it, you know, boom. And um, when the EMTs got there, also guys that I work with, so from them, they, they saw this mashed up pickup truck. And they, they go, oh my god, that's my truck. This is going to be bad. And we get around to the other side of the truck, which of course that's not damaged at all. They open the door, and I'm laying in there perfectly fine. Um, not a hair out of place. I, they, were, they, were, they could have been out of place. <laughs> <laughs> they, they weren't out of place. I, um, so I thought I was just unconscious, and then they started taking my vitals, and they realized that no, I was mostly dead. And everyone's got one little thing. I'm like, if this one thing had been a little different, I wouldn't be here today. For me, the amazing thing was they had just got a pneumatic split a month before. And if they did not have a pneumatic split, they would not have been a blood pressure up, I would not have made it to regions. And so that's my boom, close story. I got to regions and I was in a coma for 10 days. And when I came out of, well, you drift out of the coma over a long period of time. Eventually, I got to the point that I was sitting there going, this is weird. And I, I never think of things as good or bad. They're either boring or interesting. And I'm going, this is interesting. <laughs> and I became quite certain that it was a dream. Because where else would in a dream would I be? In this hospital, people around me going, oh, the story almost died. You know, and I looked down and there's nothing wrong with it. It says in my, my uh, hospital record, patient arrived in pristine condition. <laughs> so uh, it, it was interesting from a brain injury point of view, because most people with brain injuries have a lot of other <coughs> trauma to their body. I just had this closed head, diffuse axonal brain injury, they call it. Um, so I you know, put a stereo on a pain shaker, it's kind of like that. So I'm looking out of my body, and I'm like, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm, I'm fine, nothing's broken. I'm not, I was not in any pain. And I had tubes coming in on me, but not just window dressing, it looks good. And the thing I want you to know, if you're going to take one thing away from this today, is that from the inside, a brain injured person can't tell they have a brain injury. You can't tell your brain injury. You might feel dizzy, but you felt dizzy before. It's not a brain injury. You might feel tired, worn out. That's not. What does a brain injury feel like? You know, it, it's the confusion and stuff. But it, it, you talk to people and they don't understand you. Is it your fault or their fault? It, it's their fault. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. They're not getting it. And to mock me, they speak to me in complete gibberish. Or they talk real fast, and I can't follow it. And everything's an inside joke, and I'm not involved in that. And, and it's kind of frustrating. And kind of angry. You get short tempered with people. Because one of the reasons a lot of brain people are very short tempered is because, yeah, it's just frustrating that they can't do what they want, but they feel like they sound just fine. And for some reason, you're not getting it. And then when you talk back to them, you talk from gibberish, you're talking too fast, you're not clearly announcing what your intentions are. <coughs> so know that. And I'll get back to that a few times, perhaps. See how well I remember it. Okay. <laughs> now, OK, here's something. Um, if you have something to write on, you're cool. If you don't, just, just make this list. If you make a list, three things, five things, whatever. Five things about yourself that make you who you are, uniquely about you. It doesn't, 
you know, your certifications, your talents, your skills. You don't have to be not just things that I'm better than anybody else in this, but just I'm good at this. I take pride that I can do this. And including things like I'm a good spouse, I'm a good parent, I'm a good child taking care of older parents. We all have roles we fill in different respects. So choose five, it doesn't be the biggest five, it's not gonna, it, I'm not gonna test anyone. But you see, you have these five things that you fulfill. And I keep going over this to give everybody time to write down the five things, or think of the five things that make you who you are. And now what I'd like you to do is take one of those things off the list. Now, who are you? Whatever that thing is, you can't do that anymore. It might still need to be done, but you're not able to do it. Who does that make you? What does that do to your identity? All right, I'll take another thing off that list. Now, two things, two of five, almost half the things that you take pride in make you who you are, aren't you anymore. Who are you? All right, we'll do this one more time. Take a third thing out of that list. Now, over half the things that make you who you are aren't you anymore. So you don't do that. They need to be done with you. You don't do it. Not your role of play. You cannot do it. All right, now, imagine you wake up one morning and you can't do any of that. None of those things. Who are you? If you doubt that you're still you, call the person who holds your mortgage. You'll be quite confident you are still you. <laughs> but other than that, you don't feel like you and you. Nothing that, nothing that it means to be you has any purchase in your life anymore. And when this occurred to me, and I was kind of laying here in bed making my own list. I right know, don't do that, can't do that, can't do that. And I felt like I couldn't ever do that because as far as I was concerned, I can't do my brain injury. I'm fine, but I can't do any of those things anymore. And I felt so ripped off. I felt so violated. I wanted to be able to say, didn't happen. Too over. I said, this is just wrong. This didn't happen. And the more I thought about it, the blacker and darker the universe got. And it just congealed this black, massive stuff around my heart. And the whole world, all the lenses inside were all black. And I saw the world, everything. I just did not want to be here. I just did not want to do this. And I hated everything. I hated myself. And it was just, and it, I can't even, I can't describe it. It's just really intense. And it got to the point that I finally said, I surrender. Now there's two ways to surrender. The one way is to surrender to a higher power. Most brain people you meet, have a very strong abiding faith in a higher power that sustains them. And that is awesome. And that is not what I was able to do. That's not my makeup. So I surrendered my own way. The other way you can surrender is to simply say, I refuse to fight. Come on, come at me. I refuse to fight. The interesting thing, now this is real obvious to everyone on the outside, but not at all clear to me at all, was as soon as I did that, all this fear and hatred for this evil, evil world left me. Because it was all coming from me. So it was like in this flash of insight, instant, just whoosh, this stuff flew off me, you know, peeled the paint off the wall, cracked the wall, blew up the door, blew up the windows. Cards, flowers, everything else with us. 
and left me there with this amazing feeling because I had all the blackness was gone. And I looked around and I, and I reassessed where I was at. I basically at that point accepted that that had happened. That from now on as I negotiate my way through life, as I prosecute my day, I'm not going to do it with this, with this anger and this regret. And it was at that point that I discovered my first superpower. Because you don't know how superpowers happen. You know, you have exposure to radiation or toxic waste or gamma rays from outer space. And then the superhero gets these superhero powers. That's really how you use them at first. I found I had a superpower. I call it epic grace. Because I forgave the universe and everything in it, and everything that was ever done. And I forgave myself. And when I had done that, I could then forgive anyone, anything that I chose. And that is an amazing way to go through life. Do I practice what I preach? Boy, I try. I have to remind myself from time to time, no, oh, remember, that'd be great, cool. You're good, you're good. But you gotta make the, yeah, I had to make the discreet observation. Now, See where I'm at. The second superpower I had, the first one's epic grace. The second superpower I had, closely related but fundamentally different, I call epic perspective. I died in that accident. Now, it wasn't in a near death experience where, where they pronounced me dead, I saw light at the end of the tunnel, and, uh, and then I got called back because I had more to do. No. That, that, that did not happen. That's a near death experience. I had a near life experience. I got hit and I almost lived. But that person is dead and gone. And that was important for me to know. Because a lot of people have heard about living a double life. You know, bringing a damn in a common by night, a secret agent. <laughs> but a double life. I, I live a double life, but it's been lived consecutively. I lived one life when I was 25, one life in 25, wow. and they connect, but they're not really, that's not me, and I needed to set that life aside, because there's nothing positive coming out of trying to connect with that part of my life anymore. <coughs> because I, at first, I, I was just a shadow, a shade of what I was before. And it was only going to cause me anger and anguish. And you can tell this a lot in brain to people because what do they talk about? Well, I used to be like this. I used to be able to do this. They, they take the focus off the now. They put the pride in what they used to be. I did it too. From time to time, I still do. I'll admit it. But I've got this attitude that not me. That person died. And now, and yet, I'm still alive. I'm still here. And that allows me to reevaluate myself. Now, I'm a whole different person, went in different directions than I ever would have went. Am I better? I'm different. But I needed to leave that behind. So if you're dealing with brain people, they need to leave that behind. And now, now here's an interesting thing. Now, one of the things people always remember is how good the memory was before they had a brain issue. Now, everybody's got a bad memory. Everyone I've ever met has got a bad memory. The 
And here's how you can tell if someone's going to get a brain injury. Because the only people I've ever met who have good memories are people who subsequently got a brain injury. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, like, I've had a bad memory, you know, well, we all got bad memories. No, 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 my memory used to be amazing. I'd walk into a zoo and yell at me going, oh, this guy was good. <laughs> you know, so. But then you need to leave that past behind you. So that's epic perspective. Epic grace, epic perspective. And the third one is epic will. There is nothing that I have done in my life harder than brain injury recovery. And I've done things since then that are very hard. But Charles Dickens has a definition of frustration. And he says it's when the result is not commensurate with the effort. And I can't think of anything that describes brain injury rehabilitation more than the result not being commensurate with the effort. Because from a brain injury person's perspective, when you go down, I say you go down to rehab because I was on the ninth, the rehab floor was ninth floor, and you went down to rehab down on the ground floor. You go down to rehab every day. I could, as far as I was concerned, my entire life had been in that hospital. There was some time behind that, but as far as I could actually remember, I was I've always been in this hospital. And every day I went down to rehab. And I did as much as I could do. And when I got down to one thing, they had me another thing. And it was hard. And I couldn't tell that I was getting better. They were telling me, again, the only indication I had was what other people were telling me. You're doing very well. You're coming up nicely along. But it didn't feel that way to me. It felt like every day I was coming down, every day I was looking for the cheese, and then they'd give me a new, I found the cheese and give me a new <coughs> maze to run through. And I'm so grateful for the rehab professionals that were working with me. Because I could not have done this by myself. I could not have done that every day. And the hats off on them me. I'm just, I'm humbled by it. And every day I came down there, and it, as for as long as it, as far as I could see behind me, as far as I could imagine in front of me, this is what was going to be, be my role every day to come down and do these things. But it taught me, you know, if I can do this, Nothing else was hard. Either. I uh, last fall I took a physics class. It was a a calc based physics class. I needed to get my new two year degree. I needed to take a five credit science class, and physics is what worked. Um, now I hadn't actually taken a math class since the seventies. Only algebra, and I did poorly at. <laughs> and I would take this, but I had this, this epic will, and I said, okay, I will do this. And I was able to do it. Because, and what made it possible for me is that it was, it was actually harder day by day than anything I'd ever done before. But I was getting something. At the end of the week, I understood trigonometric functions. I didn't understand those originally. This was huge. I was learning things, and I could tell. So in that sense, it seemed easy to me compared to the rehab stuff that was just hard every day and got me nowhere. The hardest thing
were pretty sure that if I somehow came out of my coma, that I would need permanent care the rest of my life. So they were telling my family to start looking at nursing homes and extended care. And I was engaged at the time. And if you could, she was an amazing young woman. Beautiful, very beautiful, drop dead gorgeous, genius level IQ, had a great job, great future, engaged to her soulmate. And then this happened. And she found herself in a hospital. And they were telling her things, and she didn't know what that meant. She goes, what do you mean, oh my god, he's got a temperature of 108, we have to get that down. My dad, being a sensitive guy he is, and she said, what, why do they have to get that down? What happens if they don't? He said, his brain will boil. <laughs> Now, my dad was probably terrified of himself, and it's just what came out. But <laughs> in Benjamin, poor fiance, um, spoiler alert, she's my wife now. And
I love you. I'm thinking that. Each thing I do, each step I take is me telling my wife I love her because I couldn't tell her I loved her. And I'm standing up. And now she says, hey, I'm standing sort of, yeah. She goes, Mike, you know, that, that's awesome. <laughs> that, that so rocks. I didn't think you could do that. All right, you know, if you need to, <laughs> don't fall over. If you need to, you can sit back down. And I was like, no, oh, no, I came here to walk. So, I'm getting ready. It's the first step, and the first step is huge. And it's kind of, walking is so complicated. <laughs> but okay, I gotta put the weight over on the left foot, because my left side is my bad side. I'm gonna go with my good side. Bring my right foot forward. I can do this. I can do this. I'm just, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. I get ready. Weights on the left foot. Just start. And that's not quite going to do it. All right. Oh, my legs are burning. My arms are burning. My. Wonderful AT therapist is telling me, Mike, this is awesome. If you need to sit down, you can sit down. I'm just like, whoop. Mm. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> if I could say that. Um, all right, I'm leaning forward. I love you. And I did it. And I did it. And I did it. I was thinking back about the decision my wife had made just to, that I was going to be okay, that I was going to be able to do this. And she listened to my mom. Now you have to know this about my mom. I love my mom. Who doesn't love my mom? I love my mom. <laughs> my mom is the biggest dreamer in the world. Since she was, ever since I was little, she's I'm going to do this one day, I'm going to do this one day, this is a great man, this. And she lives on these dreams. They never go anywhere, they never come to anything. <laughs> or they're just pale shades of what it was. But she always has always dreamed. And so you kind of take what she says with a grain of salt. I mean, she's in her 70s now. She's, you know what she's going to do this spring? She's planting an orchard. <laughs> she's going to have an orchard. <laughs> But you know, in all her dreams and all her possessions, she's been right once. And the one time she was right was when she was talking about me. She said, Mike will be okay. You watch, Mike will come way better from this than ever before. And my wife, who is an eminently practical person, for some reason chose then to listen to her. <laughs> Going to, I am going to do this. That's right, this is where I'm at. Okay. <laughs> now, now, I'm the, now I'm the trouble. <laughs> I got one foot forward and one foot back. I, no, I can rest on this back leg, but this gets me over. I need to rest on the front leg. But you can't just rest on the front leg. You've got to kind of roll your whole body forward. And this is one step, but this isn't walking. If I'm going to walk, it has to be two steps. So I'm here, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And now the pressure's on because everyone in rehab room is watching me. <laughs> I think most of these people are going to fall. And so, I'm, I'm going to do this though. So. <sighs> I love you. And I did it. And it's great. I felt so victorious because now I knew, I knew. I was going to be able to walk down that aisle. I went to raise my hands over my head and I went to move. <laughs> all over. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm just going to lean in this one. Put this hand up. <laughs> Thank you.
Yep. A little bit. That was the story, front to end. So here's, the, here's, here's Appendix A. Because a lot of people in there are interested in speech. Speech pathology. Speech pathology. Um, I have a very difficult time speaking clearly. I can do it right now, because I'm all jazzed up and I've heard all these people and stuff. But on a regular basis, and especially for the evening, I have a hard time, a real hard time talking clearly, speaking clearly. About a year after my accident, it was my birthday, and they did a videotape of my birthday. Song. Videotape, and I was mortified at how I sounded because I didn't realize I still sounded so poorly. And this really ate away at my self image because, of course, in my mind, I sounded fine. And I thought to myself, what can I do to improve on this? How can I, how can I do this? Because, of course, insurance wasn't going to pay for any more speech therapy. They only go so far. Um, and I remembered when I was in high school and college taking German, how good it felt to walk out of class afterwards and be able to speak English again. Be able to pronounce the words I wanted to say, to say the things I meant. And I'm going, I want that feeling again. English, I can do that. So I started studying German again. <laughs> and I would work on it, and I never got that good at it. My memory, I mean, I have no memory. So, but it always felt good to stop and start speaking English again. <laughs> but I got to the point, I'm pretty good with language, and I got to the point that, you know, I was reading books in German, and so it wasn't really, my purpose was not to learn German, my purpose was to make my English better. So I asked a friend of mine who's a linguist what the toughest language is to speak if you're an English speaker. And he said, well, it's either Chinese or Finnish. And I didn't want to try learning a whole other letter system because it wasn't where I was going. So I said, okay, I'll learn Finnish. And so for the next three years, Every day, I would listen to Finnish tapes. Now, when I, I put something in my routine. That's how I get it done. I do it. Now, I can't do it for four hours every day. But for 15 or 20 minutes every day, I would listen to Finnish. I would try to pronounce the Finnish. And my Finnish didn't really get that good. But my English improved immensely because English was so much easier to say. <laughs> And eventually, the Finnish never got easy. And then I, I dropped Finnish because I was around some Spanish people and they had Spanish classes being offered at work. So I took Spanish and got my Spanish going pretty good. So now I speak German, Finnish, and Spanish. <laughs> and I speak it like a native, if that native is two years old. <laughs> That's the end of Appendix A. <laughs> <laughs> try to do is speak publicly. So that's what I had to do. Because that, that's, that's what I, I like to say is my friend Walt Kern wrote this in a book and I love it. It's, you know, I honed my will on adversity. 
So the harder it is, the more determined I am that I'm going to do this. <coughs> and so my greatest fear was speaking. Was to be, I mean, I was always, it was always a dream of mine, even in the, the other life I lived before, that someday I'd be a, a speaker up there, talking to people. Of course, I had nothing to say back then. That was a minor detail. So <laughs> now I have something to say, but at the time, I'm no longer really able to say it. But now I, I could speak. And what actually got me into it was the, the writing I did. Because I got the Brain Injury uh, Alliance newsletter, and I liked it and everything it had, but I didn't feel there was anything that spoke to me as a survivor. Um, so I wrote what I wanted to see. And I sent it in, and they, they published it. And then I, about a year later, I sent another one in, and they published that. And they called me up and said, would you like to be a regular contributor? Sure. So I started writing these basically 300 to 500 word essays on whatever I wanted to, something about brain injury. And eventually it got to the point that they said, you know, people keep asking for back issues. You ought to put this stuff in a book. So I published what I had in a book. And since then I put out another book, again, of these short essays, which fill a niche because there's a lot of books out there and they're awesome, excellent books about people's different people's stories about brain injury. But they're a 200 page book. If you've got a brain injury, it's, it's inspiring to read it, but it's, it's daunting to see. And these are just 300 to 500 word essays. And they get right to the, I, I, concision is my friend. I get right to the point, whatever I'm talking about, immediate satisfaction. Um, and so then, you start talking to small groups, support groups, and stuff like that. And if you do okay, it gets bigger and bigger. Next thing you know, you're a keynote speaker. So, <laughs> that's how I got where I am today. 